Hello, welcome to Anatomy and Physiology audio series learning module number five. This module covers uh, muscle contraction. Uh, the chapter, which I strongly advise you to read in addition to viewing this module, is chapter nine on the muscular system. Um, of course, anything in this learning module is fair game for the exam as well as uh, the little quiz that you'll have at the beginning of class next time we meet. So uh, you need to be familiar with the material inside this module for next class. All right, let's begin. Okay, so first of all, key concept. In order to move, skeletal muscles must contract. Okay, contraction really just means shortening. They get shorter. The muscle itself gets shorter. So to understand what's actually happening during a muscle contraction, we have to get inside the muscle cell, the muscle fiber, again. So we've already looked at this diagram before. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But this is just to uh, reiterate a, per, uh, a very important concept. You are expected to understand most of the most of the structures on this diagram. Once again, look down at the bottom. This is where we are. So this is this this little story of muscle contraction that we're going to tell. This is where it takes place. We're going to tell the story of muscle contraction in only one of these little units called sarcomeres. However, just remember. When a muscle contracts, millions of these units are shortening at the same time, and that's what's causing the entire muscle to contract. Okay, but we're only going to look at a muscle contraction in just one, one, of these, um, one of these units. Okay, so once again, let's start at the top of the diagram. Um, just to review a little bit, you have the whole muscle. The whole muscle is bundles of fascicles. Fascicles are bundles of muscle fibers or muscle cells. Muscle cells are bundles of myofibrils. Myofibrils are composed of actin and myosin, and in the myofibril are these units called sarcomeres, and those are at the bottom. Um, on the left, it's showing you uh, the actin and myosin uh, filaments, the proteins themselves, and if you look at the left versus the right, what you'll notice is that the distance um, between what's called the Z line there, those lines that are called Z lines, and the myosin, what's called the myosin head, if you notice that distance changes, right? It gets shorter when you start out from the left. If you look at the diagram on the left, diagram on the right, you'll notice that on the right, it's shorter that distance. Also, the thin filaments, if you look at the left versus the right, have moved. They've moved in towards each other. Okay, so there's more, there's less space between the thin filaments on the right after a muscle contracts. But what's actually happening is the entire unit is shortening, getting shorter, and that is a muscle contraction. Recall that the nervous system controls the muscle contraction. So neurons and muscle cells connect at a space called the neuromuscular junction. So once again, whether you're talking about skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, it doesn't matter. They are all controlled by the nervous system. So anytime you have a neuron and encountering a muscle cell, that's called the neuromuscular junction. It's really the same concept as a synapse, except the synapse is between nerve cells. So in the case of a skeletal muscle, because we are talking complete, only about skeletal muscle in this particular mini lecture, um, and remember skeletal muscle is attached to bone, moves your bones around, right, um, among other things, and then, um, the neurotransmitter that's released, just like in a synapse, there's neurotransmitters that are released. The neurotransmitter that's released at the neuromuscular junction in the case of skeletal muscle is called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. Um, you might as well learn it now since it will come up later. When we're talking about 
the nervous control of skeletal muscle. We're talking about motor neurons, neurons that are sending motor information from the brain to the muscle. This is also known as the somatic nervous system, okay? Voluntary is another word associated with this particular system. All right, so here you have uh, the neuromuscular junction and what's released at the neuromuscular junction, a uh, neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. If you look at the diagram at the right, you can see uh, the green uh, substance. That's acetylcholine. That's what's being released there at the neuromuscular junction. And if you look at the other side of the neuromuscular junction, which is the muscle cell, you'll see those little receptors there, and they're waiting to catch the ball. They're waiting to catch the green uh, acetylcholine. And that is what is going to stimulate, this is a key concept, so listen, that is going to stimulate a muscle contraction. When acetylcholine crosses that little space and gets caught in the receptors on the other side. All right, so I did mention that we were going to uh, go over this in class, but I was incorrect. We are actually going over this in the mini lecture. Sorry about that. Um, and, it, and there's nothing on here that you have to memorize, or, or um, this is not test material. This is material to reinforce what we've been discussing about the importance of the neuromuscular junction. This is the place where the neurons and muscles, muscle cells uh, connect. And um, there are uh, various conditions that can result that the cause of uh, the symptoms of, of the condition um, is some sort of impairment at the neuromuscular junction, okay? So these are just some examples. If you look up the upper left, that's myasthenia gravis. This is a disease um, that causes weakened uh, muscles. This, this person has, has very weak muscles. And this is due to um, a, a miscommunication at the, at the neuromuscular junction. We feel choline there in the green, those little green balls. There's, uh, there is a, uh, there's some difficulty on the receiving end of the, um, the muscle. So that results in a weakened muscle contraction. If you look at the upper right, that's curare. It's the poison that can block uh, acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. If you look at the picture there, you'll see that the curare is in black, and that's it, the curare is actually blocking the acetylcholine by physically combining with the receptors, and it's blocking uh, the acetylcholine from hooking up with the receptors and causing a muscle contraction. So um, that prevents muscle contraction. And then the lower left there. That is an infection by um, a bacterium, Clostridium botulinum. This is a bacterium that causes what you may have heard of called botulism. And um, that is an uh, exotoxin that the, the uh, bacterium releases. And the result of the, exo the, the, ex the exotoxin actually blocks the acetylcholine from being released from the neuron at the neuromuscular junction. So if the neurotransmitter, if acetylcholine is not released, then of course the muscle can't contract. If you look at the lower right, this is another example. This is an infection by Clostridium tetany. This is another bacterium that um, releases a toxin that actually does the opposite of botulism, which is that it, it increases the amount of acetylcholine. So there's too much acetylcholine released at the neuromuscular junction. So this results in um, spasms or excessive um, overstimulation of, of the muscle contraction. So these are just some examples of how important the neuromuscular junction is. Oh, here's this diagram again. So <laughs> we've mentioned this several times, but just to remind you, again, actin and myosin, which are the, the uh, proteins that you find in muscle tissue, Make up the myofibr make up the myofibrils, and those are organized into these little units called sarcomeres. So we already went into detail about this. Um, so just to remind you that that is where we are when we're telling this story of muscle contraction. This is where we are right here at the sarcomere. 
Okay, so now we're going to go through the actual steps of a muscle contraction, um, one by one. So you're expected to know how a muscle contracts. Um, we're not going into a tremendous amount of detail. You're just supposed to know the basic steps that occur. Okay, so we're not necessarily going to cover every last detail. Okay, so if you look at the diagram uh, in blue there at the top, I hope you recognize that as uh, the axon terminal of a neuron because we are at the neuromuscular junction. And then the rest of the diagram is, of course, uh, a muscle cell. Okay, so I want to draw your attention to number one right there, okay, um, which is, you can see in the, uh, the neuron itself, right, number one. And there's a mitochondria, there's a I'll note that there's a mitochondria on there too because remember this is going to require a lot of ATP. All right, so step one, the nerve impulse arrives at the neuromuscular junction and releases acetylcholine into the space. Okay, no big surprise there. We've discussed that in some detail. So this is what initiates a muscle contraction. This is what starts the whole process. And in this, a couple slides ago, remember that there are um, some conditions and um, poisons and stuff that can, that where they actually operate is right here at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, step two. Step two. The impulse is carried along the sarcolemma, okay? This, I don't think we've talked about this term before, but this is just a fancy word for the cell membrane of muscle cells. It's still the cell membrane. Um, it's just a fancy word for the actual uh, membrane of the skeletal muscle cell. So it's called the sarcolemma. sarcolemma. So the impulse is carried along the sarcolemma and travels deeper within the cell through something called T-tubules. Okay, and it's th these T-tubules, if you look at the diagram, where we are is in the, um, on the left side of the diagram where it says action potential. Don't, we haven't talked about an action, what an action potential is yet, but we will in, in the future. Action potential just means the nerve impulse, okay? And it's being sent along that membrane, along the cell membrane, into, deep into the cell through something called the T-tubule. So the T-tubule are these T-tubules are these deep invaginations, or you can think of them as holes if you want to, deep holes in the membrane that bring the message quickly to the sarcomere. Because remember, that's where we're headed. All right, so that's the next step. So first step, acetylcholine release. Next step, the impulse travels along the sarcolemma down into the cell through the T-tubules. Step three, the impulse stimulates calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This is just a fancy word for the endoplasmic reticulum. So if you look at the arrow there, that's pointing to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and calcium is, is um, stored there in the sarcoplasmic reticulum and the impulse itself stimulates calcium release. So calcium is um, a, a, you know, a mineral that, that you need in your diet. This is just one of the reasons why you need calcium, because calcium is involved in muscle contraction. Okay, so that's step three. And finally, calcium helps form cross bridges Okay, between actin and myosin. And basically, that means that it helps the actin and myosin proteins to connect with each other, and the muscle is able to contract. We're not going to go into too much detail. If you are going to watch a little video that will sort of show you exactly how this occurs. Um, <clears throat> I like to think of it as like a rowboat kind of a situation, but the actin and myosin slide past each other, and, and that is what causes the... Um, the shortening of the muscle or the contraction. Very important, this requires energy. This requires ATP. Muscles have other sources of energy. Your book goes into that. We're not going to discuss that, but um, there are just FYI, there are other sources of energy besides ATP that the muscle cell can use. 
Okay, so this is just showing you a, um, a more detailed picture of what's happening right there in the sarcomere uh, with, between the actin and the myosin. You can study that for a while, the difference between when the sarcomere is relaxed versus when it is contracting and what's actually happening there with the actin and myosin. In order for that to happen, calcium is necessary and um, ATP or some form of energy is also necessary. All right, so um, that concludes this um, mini lecture on muscle contraction, but I do want you to watch this animation. Um, this is going to be a, um, a more detailed look at muscle contraction. It'll help you to better understand the process um, when you can actually see it happening in 3D. I want you to pay attention to what's happening, but don't stress out about having to know every single step. There's more in the video. There's more information in the video than there is in the mini lecture. So I just want you to absorb what you can because it will help you to um, have a better understanding of what we discussed. But there may be more information in this 3D video than you need to be familiar with. So just try to follow it as best you can. Um, I would watch it a couple times and familiarize yourself with the steps of muscle contraction. But once again, there's going to be more information in this animation than I've given you in the PowerPoint. And you're only responsible for what is in the actual um, lecture itself.